Hi, folks. This is Professor Chad McGuire, and welcome to our next video lecture uh, regarding ocean policy and law. And this is the management of coastal resources with specific fo focus on the Coastal Zone Management Act in the United States. So the first thing we can do is we can begin here uh, by recalling the traditional zones of the coastline, as more particularly described in our previous uh, lecture materials and video um, and with a visual representation here. And what we can see here is um, we can see the coastal zone includes both portions of dry land. If we look here, for example, uh, the sort of dry sand vegetation area and a bit of the upland that's represented in this uh, red uh, dotted uh, square, uh, and also portions um, of submerged land. And we can see that, um, for example, in the uh, blue uh, dotted line portion here, where we include some of the wet sand. And um, for most coastal states in the United States, the coastal zone is defined um, in a mix of ways, uh, sometimes through this red dotted line and sometimes through this uh, blue dotted line. As we noted previously, at least in the United States, um, the exact extent of the coastal zone varies depending on the legal definition applied in a particular coastal state. We do not have a federal standardized definition of coastal zone in this sense, Rather, each coastal state provides a defined geographic boundary based on a number of factors. And in this way, we come to understand that the term coastal zone itself has a legal political definition. So although the coastal zone shares similar physical characteristics from one state to another, there will be differences among these states in how they define the exact characteristics of their coastal zone. And in the example here, we have in the blue dotted line, this would represent states like Massachusetts. It's an example that I brought up previously, uh, the state that I live in and uh, do a lot of work in. Massachusetts has a legal definition of a coastal zone that always encompasses some upland area. And um, for most of the state, that's usually something between uh, a number of feet, usually 100 feet beyond some sort of physical human characteristic. And that's usually the, if there's a road, for example, that runs parallel to a coastline in Massachusetts, then usually 100 feet beyond that road uh, is considered uh, part of the coastal zone. Although if we're talking about specific areas like uh, Cape Cod, for example, then the entire um, land of that, that area of Cape Cod is specially defined as a coastal zone. I think we also mentioned or identified previously uh, the state of Hawaii, for example, includes all of the land. It's an island state and all of its island land is considered part of the coastal zone. That includes even if you go up into the mountainous areas. That's just how Hawaii defines its coastal zone. And there are really important sort of legal and political reasons for this, not the least of which is once your coastal zone is defined, there's a lot of incentives under federal law, specifically the Coastal Zone Management Act, the thing that we're talking about here today, um, which provides a lot of what we call carrots or funding, you know, provides a lot of reason. So if you define your coastal zone and you establish certain protocols uh, that we'll get into in a bit, a coastal management plan, then the federal government will provide uh, financial resources to you in order to uh, manage um, once you've had an approved coastal management plan to manage those coastal resources. So there's a lot of incentives for coastal states uh, in the United States to identify coastal zones. And for some, they identify it broadly. Like I said, Hawaii, it's the entire landmass. Massachusetts always identifies, excuse me, its coastal zone all the way down to the low tide mark, uh, the, the mean low tide line. Whereas many other states, uh, coastal states, they identify their um, the extent of their coastal zone to the uh, the dry sand. So this is the, you know, at low tide, this is exposed, and at high tide, this is underwater, this wet sand area, the intertidal zone. And um, it's just important to know this because depending on which state you're in, where there are all kinds of um, issues that uh, are involved. And we talk about some of these issues in terms of public access in the previous uh, video lecture and materials, which you can uh, find uh, on our uh, site there on, on the YouTube channel here, if you want to, uh, uh, to take a look at that uh, additional or in the course materials, the previous uh, lecture materials. So this is important to know because although there are physical characteristics, clear physical characteristics that help to define a coastal zone, it is not when we talk about coastal zones here, 
and for purposes of the Coastal Zone Management Act, um, it is not a scientific definition, solely a scientific definition. All coastal zones will share similar physical characteristics, but they will be different based on legal political designations, how those states particularly define their coastal zones. And that's important. So beyond the, the differences in the definitions of coastal zone adopted by each coastal state, there are also differences in the approaches coastal states take in the management of their defined coastal resources. And we can see that if we go forward and we look at, for example, this uh, image. So here we have three different coastal states, coastal state A, B, and C. We have, um, their, they are next to each other, right? So they sort of touch each other. And then there's a three mile state territorial jurisdiction as we move into the water. And then after three miles, there's federal jurisdiction. And it runs from that three mile uh, state limit to some other point. And um, we've talked about that previously, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in terms of international uh, uh, in a future lecture, uh, sort of international considerations. So we can think about these different coastal states and we can say, for example, that these coastal states have different priorities. For example, coastal state A may be in an area uh, that really focuses on tourism. What's really important to the coastal zone as coastal state A is concerned is tourism, uh, including the use of its coastal waters for recreational purposes. So for coastal state A, water quality and natural resource protection might be a high priority because these qualities are important contributors to its focus on tourism and the economic benefits that flow from tourist activities. Coastal state B um, may have different priorities when it comes to its coastal waters. So for example, uh, rather than focusing on tourism, it might ha have a history of utilizing its coastal waters for offshore oil and gas development. In this case, coastal state B may prioritize energy development over water quality issues. And still, coastal state C might have a thriving local commercial fishing industry and identifies its coastal waters as important nursery habitat where commercial fish species develop from juveniles to adults. Thus, coastal state C might prioritize the protection of its coastal waters to support its commercial fishery. So we can see where these different coastal states that are adjacent to one another have different core um, priorities when it comes to the use of their coastal zones. Coastal state A, tourism, coastal state B, oil and gas development, and coastal state C, uh, commercial fishing, let's say, or just fishing. Now there's some shared space uh, in terms of what's important to protect. You can think coastal state A and coastal state C, for example, might share some interest where, look, in order to ensure water quality is sufficient to support fishery habitat, particularly nursery habitat, a lot of the commercial target fish that we seek uh, in the United States and many other countries out in, you know, in federal jurisdiction or, or water that's well offshore, um, they come into close shore waters, uh, near shore waters, and that's where they, you know, um, that's where they propagate and that's where they hatch. And so uh, they're, they're juveniles and the juvenile versions of those fish, the young versions of those fish, before they go off into deep waters, they spend a period of time, if not years, depending on the type of fish species in those near coastal waters sort of developing. That's why we call it nurseries. So um, if you wanna have a vibrant offshore fishing industry off the near shore, you really need to protect near shore waters because that's where the fish, many of the fish propagate and that's where many of their young sort of develop and to the point where they've grown big enough, large enough, uh, and they fed on local, uh, you know, being able to hide from larger predators from the uh, open waters and gotten to the point where they can now move uh, offshore and become adults and then ultimately become part of what our target uh, species, uh, fish species in terms of the population. So to have a, a healthy, thriving commercial fishing um, population, target fish species population, you often have to protect your nearshore waters. So coastal state C really wants to have important high water quality um, and important ecosystem habitats, the natural ecosystem. And that's, you can see that very much with coastal state A because many of those features of those you know, water quality and the ecosystem features of the nearshore are also exactly what people look for when they go for tourism. They wanna have a nice sandy beach, 
beach. They want to have all of those natural sort of connections in terms of the near water, the intertidal zone. They want the, the sort of marshes, everything that keeps the water clean, that creates that sort of uh, the, uh, the natural conditions for tourism. And I know part of tourism certainly is recreational fishing, for example. Uh, so those are closely connected. But the point is, we can see that although they might prioritize different things, though there's a lot of shared space. And certainly oil and gas development uh, in and of itself might also have some shared space with uh, tourism as a priority or fishing as a priority. But there's a lot of space that isn't shared. And when you prioritize one over the other, we can think that they can run into conflict. And the clear example has to be, uh, at least in the United States, is if we think of Coastal State A as an example, Florida, or Coastal State B as an example, Texas. Texas certainly cares about tourism and you know has a thriving tourism industry, particularly ocean related tourism industry in the Gulf of Mexico in particular. And so does Florida on its Gulf Coast side. Texas also has a long history of prioritizing offshore oil and gas development in the Gulf of Mexico. And we can see how that can run into conflict both within the state you can think of Texas, this is Coastal State B is not meant to be Texas, but if we think of Texas, we can say Texas prioritizes both oil and gas development and, you know, um, you know, tourism and other and even fishing, you know, uh, as a, both commercial and certainly recreational uh, endeavor uh, that are all water dependent, uh, has a lot of these priorities. What it prioritizes more uh, is sort of up for debate, you know, maybe a little bit, but in terms of if it was trying to create a hierarchy or a sort of a, a list of, you know, highest priority to lesser priorities. But uh, certainly we can see where, you know, some of those um, priorities, even if they're within the same state, uh, they can run into conflict with one another. So the examples of coastal states A, B, and C provide some insight into the different kinds of priorities that can exist amongst coastal states and the use of their coastal waters. Now imagine if coastal states existing in immediate proximity to one another have different priorities where those differences have the potential to impact each other's priorities. So where coastal states A priority has the uh, capacity or possibility of impacting coastal state B, Coastal state B to coastal state C to coastal state A, et cetera, right? Or imagine the situation where coastal states' priorities for its coastal waters are being impacted by federal activities that exist just outside of the coastal state's jurisdiction. For example, a federal permit for oil and gas development existing just beyond the three mile jurisdictional limit of a coastal state that prioritizes the pristine water quality of its waters. So, for example, we can take a look at this in our. Uh, our, our visual here, and we can say, look, I understand coastal state A, B, and C, they have three mile state territorial jurisdiction, and that jurisdiction is separated from one another, but they can engage in activities. So coastal state A can engage in activities within its jurisdiction that can have an impact on coastal state B, as you can see from the, uh, the green, um, you know, um, circle here, and um, that's moving between the jurisdictions of coastal state A and coastal state B within their state territorial waters, and the same thing between B and C, and certainly, like we said, um, between all of them, that, you know, coastal state A can do something that has an influence on B and C, B can do something for an a that influences A and C, and C that influences A and B, so on and so forth, and those influences can either have a positive or negative uh, reinforcement of the priorities of the other coastal states. Sometimes what coastal state A does might help coastal state B in its priorities, but can also hurt coastal state B and vice versa, so on and so forth. So we can think about that. And the other thing that we can think about is there's uh, federal activities that not only what these coastal states do impact the other coastal states, but maybe what they do can impact federal priorities, what the federal government wants to do in its waters, anything beyond three miles, and certainly what the federal government might want to do within its jurisdiction can impact anything that happens in these coastal state waters as well. So we can think about that. So if the federal activity has the potential to negatively impact the coastal priority of the state, in this case, such as where a leak in the drilling for oil can result in the oil being brought into the coastal waters by the natural movement of the tides. So certainly if the federal government wanted to uh, do an oil and gas project, for example, and it had an influence in its oil and gas project on coastal state A tourism, this influence, excuse me, might not affect coastal state B significantly, maybe oil and gas development as a priority for coastal state B naturally transfers into oil and gas development 
as a federal priority in federal waters where they can have an impact and influence on coastal state B. However, even if that's the case, let's say coastal state B, for example, has significant controls because it also prioritizes the importance of tourism and fishing and the natural well-being of its, of its near coastal waters. That might also be a priority. So it might have serious restrictions on how it goes about serious safety protocols, well above and beyond maybe what the federal government requires. So even if Coastal State B prioritizes oil and gas development, it's entirely possible that the federal government wanting to do the same kind of project might not have as many sort of checks and balances, as many restrictions on oil and gas development. So even when they have the same priorities, it's a matter of degree. So Coastal State B might be affected by federal actions, even if they prioritize the same activity because the federal government might not be as careful. And by the way, there's the reciprocal of that as well. Whereas a coastal state, for example, might really prioritize oil and gas and might not care too much about um, safety to the degree in relationship to what the federal government might care. So in other words, coastal state uh, B, just in this example, might um, permit oil and gas activities in a way that the federal government would never permit. The federal government might have higher standards uh, than the coastal state. It works in both directions. So we can think about this. We can think about all of these dynamics, but we understand that there's a sort of interdependent relationship so that what one state or what the federal government wants to do uh, influences what happens in these other jurisdictions. And if we have no rules and no laws, we understand each of these states are their own sovereigns and the federal government is its own sovereign. And if we have nothing that sort of brings together these interests and tries to uh, set up a set of you know, uh, common rules, practices, and procedures where one understands or has to understand what the other is doing, then we can we can kind of see the potential for you know, uh, where one wants to do something because of the way that water flows and the natural conditions, just like air sheds, for example, uh, where even if I'm doing it in my federal jurisdiction, it can have a serious impact and influence on those coastal states because of the natural flow of water, for example, in the movement of tides. So that's important to know. So the point being made here is there's a strong potential for competing priorities between coastal states and between a coastal state and the federal government to impact policy goals in using coastal and ocean resources. One legal framework that has been developed to try to bring all of this together and try to create basic rules is the Coastal Zone Management Act. And that's what we're talking about. It's a federal law, the Coastal Zone Management Act. It's our goal in this section, in this lecture, in this set of materials, is to better understand this federal statute and to see how it attempts to deal with conflicts among coastal states and the federal government. That's our goal. Before we get to that goal, before we look at it in great detail, we can look back and start with this notion of a policy impetus for the Coastal Zone Management Act. Like, where does the Coastal Zone Management Act come from in terms of our larger legal system in the United States? And be, based on what it is and its characteristics, what sort of rules and what sort of limitations exist around it? So before delving into the statutory elements of the Coastal Zone Management Act, we can take a moment to consider the policy setting from which the CZMA is derived. And by doing so, get some understanding of the reasons behind the statute. In addition, by looking at the development of the Coastal Zone Management Act, including the legal frameworks that constrain its powers, we can better understand some of the limitations of the Coastal Zone Management Act as a tool for implementing policy objectives. So to start this, we can bring forward our wonderful hierarchy of laws. For those of you that have seen this, um, there's it's in the administrative law. We talk about this in detail in both environmental law and administrative law. In the uh, available, if we're just looking outside of the course on the uh, YouTube channel, you will find that there are um, in the administrative law materials, there's an entire focus lecture, video lecture on hierarchy of laws. And that uh, this that can help you significantly in understanding for those that want to go to that to get a better understanding of this sort of this hierarchy of laws and what it means in terms of our sort of functioning of government and how laws are created and where, where they sit in relationship to regulations and constitutions, both at the state and federal level. So the first thing we can start at is the Coastal Zone Management Act. It's right there in the blue because it's a law. It's a federal law. It sits in the middle of our hierarchy, and it was passed by the U.S. Congress, the United States Congress, in 1972 to set up a framework 
to ensure each coastal state managed its resources in a way that would limit the differences between coastal states. Without this law, there are no standards or guidelines that might identify and create a sort of framework for putting together how coastal states both identify their priorities, identify their coastal regions, what's their coastal area, what are the priorities, and try to, try to create some basic uniformity amongst coastal states. So think about it where it's, I don't have to create, I don't even have to define my coastal zone, I'm a state, I don't, you know, before the Coastal Zone Management Act, right? I can do anything I want. So there's a lot of variability amongst coastal states prior to 1972 and the passage of the Coastal Zone Management Act. And the goal of the Coastal Zone Management Act was to really try to create some sort of beginning stages of uniformity, uh, basic uniformity, with still a lot of difference. So the impetus for this policy goal included the Stratton Commission report, which was one of the first comprehensive reports on the marine resources of the United States. One of the recommendations of that report, the Stratton Commission, was to have a more centralized approach to the management of marine resources. Thus, by creating a federal law with certain management principles, the CZMA, some consistency would be created amongst coastal states in a way, in the way coastal resources were identified, prioritized, utilized, and planned for. And that's the key. Think of it as a large scale planning, um, sort of a uniform planning mechanism for coastal states to start having a little bit more sort of, you know, uh, centralization and um, uh, and limitation on the differences uh, between um, different coastal states and their approaches to their coastal zones. So one of the questions that arose in the development of the CZMA was the degree of federal authority to pass legislation that commanded states and how they managed their coastal resources. Under traditional interpretations of federalism, the federal government has limited capacity to influence states and in how they manage their sovereign resources. And this has historically included coastal resources. So, you know, uh, there's, we can talk about, or other sections of our ocean policy and law. We talk about the Tidelands controversy and the Submerged Lands Act, uh, who owns submerged lands and, you know, why is it three mile limit for states, that sort of thing, right? And um, what are these public resources that, so we have a more explicit discussion of other issues, but in terms of what is sovereign resources and how does the, how, how do these sovereigns, whether the state, which is its own sovereign under federalism or the federal government, which is another type of sovereign under our federalism, our federalist uh, sort of constitution and uh, separation uh, between um, states and the federal government. Uh, so since the issue of federalism is imbued into the US Constitution, including an important element, the 10th Amendment, which reserves all other powers to the states that aren't explicitly enumerated in the Constitution, uh, our hierarchy of laws suggests constitutional limitations trump, uh, I'm sorry, trump statutes or laws like the CZMA that directly conflict with those constitutional pr uh, principles. So what that means is that as a federal law, and you get this under um, hierarchy of laws, it certainly has the CZMA um, has the power at the federal level and under the supremacy law to, you know, where there's a direct conflict with maybe a state law that might also regulate um, state coastal resources, the, the CZMA, where they share space and there's a direct conflict, the CZMA would be the supreme law over state law. Um, but certainly um, the CZMA is subservient to constitutional principles, including federalism, including you know, uh, a number of things uh, related to both uh, state and federal constitutional provisions. Um, and the CZMA under a doctrine of delegation allows for you know, certainly um, federal and um, for the states themselves, they do this uh, separately, but at, at the federal level for uh, places like uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, or other federal agencies to be able to create rules and regulations to implement the will of the Coastal Zone Management Act. And we see that a lot in terms of how the CZMA, in terms of how it operates and how it creates incentives and the different types of rules that are created relative to the CZMA. And of course, all of those rules have to be connected directly to the power that's created by the CZMA. In the administrative law principles, we talk about boxes. The CZMA creates a box of authority and power and whatever rule or regulation is created at the federal level can never, can never be outside of that box. It must always be within the scope of the power provided by the Coastal Zone Management Act. Congress must specifically identify what that power is and then create some sort of sense of confines. And then there's judicial interpretation where Congress is uh, 
less than direct in the language of the statute to determine whether or not the agency's actions are within that box, within the limits of that power. But that's something that you can get a better sense of uh, in the administrative law and particularly hierarchy of laws materials. So for our purposes, what we're trying to do is just understand what the CZMA does and what are the limitations on it as a law. So when, when applying our legal framework to the coastal zone, we find limits in how far the federal government can go in forcing coastal states into adopting specific policy goals uh, geared towards uniform management of coastal areas. The CZMA is an attempt to create such uniform standards, but the manner in which the statute goes about accomplishing this goal cannot be direct. For example, using command and control language that sets a standard and then forces coastal states to adhere to that standard. The lack of constitutional authority by the federal government to force coastal states to comply with uniform management approaches means the CZMA, as a representation of a policy preference, must implement the federal goal in a less direct manner. So what we're saying here, I'll use this example in a minute, but what we're saying here is that the Coastal Zone Management Act is a federal law that must use carrots rather than sticks. That's an important thing to know. So we don't have to get into that, but um, it has limited authority to force coastal states over their own direct control of their land, whether that's the land that's the uplands area that we identified before, or it moves into that three mile state territorial jurisdiction, the submerged lands that are owned by the states, the coastal states. It has very limited authority, the federal government, to, to directly regulate through command and control what states choose to do. And that's because of the limitation, the constitutional limitations, most importantly, the 10th Amendment, that limits how far the federal government can go in directing and demanding coastal states uh, in terms of how they use their own property. So that's why the hierarchy of laws is helpful to help us understand is how does the CZMA work and why does it work the way that it does? Why doesn't it just force coastal states to do certain things, right? So its um its policy preferences must um, implement federal goals in a less direct manner than command and control. So it is important to understand how the CZMA functionally operates by overlaying a legal framework analysis because it helps us see limits on how the statute can impl implement the federal policy objective to create uniform coastal management standards. For example, we know from our legal framework analysis that the federal government cannot force coastal states to adopt specific management standards by a command and control legislative directives, for example. However, it is possible for the federal government to cajole, to create incentives for coastal states into adopt, adopting these standards. And indeed, we find these very mechanisms of carrots, as we call them, contained in the CZMA as a means of getting coastal states to adopt federal standards. In fact, two of these carrots, federal funding and federal consistencies, are main topics of our conversation in the CZMA itself. So when we think about a coastal state and we think about its sovereign land property, the coastal zone. So we can look at coastal state A, for example, here, and we can say this is how it defines its coastal zone. And we see it. We know that the federal government wants to make the coastal state, wants to create some uniform standards of planning, prioritizing, and management of that coastal area. Please identify it clearly. Please tell us what your priorities are, and please tell us how you're going to manage it. Now, if you do that, we can't force you to do that in the coastal zone management. We can't make you do that. But if you choose to do it, then we're going to do two things. We're going to provide you with funding to actually do it. And we're going to provide you with something called federal consistency, which actually runs counter to this idea of specifically over here, the supremacy clause, where federal law wins under a direct conflict. So we want to create incentives for you to do this since we can't force you to do it. And maybe even if we could force you to do it, maybe it's always better, right, to say you've made the choice to do this and we've just, we just made it, we made it easier for you to make that choice because we've given you a lot of carrots, we've given you a lot of good reasons to do that. And it's important to know that this funding is not just money, uh, one-time money. It's money that continues over time. So it's money not just to figure out a coastal management plan, but it's also money to implement an approved plan, which is important because implementation goes on for a long period of time. So this is uh, really important because if a coastal state had limited resources to develop, let's say, you know, its own sort of planning and management mechanism, an administrative agency, let's say an agency at the state level, and um, 
uh, Massachusetts has its own office of coastal zone management. And that office very much exists as a result of the Coastal Zone Management Act. Before the CZMA provided funding for this, um, the Massachusetts had very limited, um, it, it, not that it had maybe limited resources, but it just didn't spend much resources on, on really concentrating and putting a state agency, developing a state agency to focus on coastal management issues and coastal state issues. But the federal government's creation of the Coastal Zone Management Act created all kinds of incentives, and that, that money is really important, and it is earmarked. It is directed specifically for the purpose of these coastal states to identify, um, prioritize, and manage their coastal resources. It gives them great freedom in how they identify, right, what is their coastal zone. It gives them great freedom. Of course, it can't exist beyond three miles. That's a federal limit, so federal government doesn't give coastal states more uh, submerged land, more ocean uh, than they're entitled to. But within those confines, the coastal states are really have a lot of degrees of freedom. And the federal consistency is really important. We'll get into the importance of federal consistency in a moment, but it's a very powerful tool. We talked about earlier, for example, how the federal government was thinking about doing an oil and gas project, but we understood it could have an impact on these coastal states and their priorities. Well, federal consistency says that when the federal government is thinking about doing something in its own land on its own property, it really needs to consider, really needs to consider the effect the potential effect before it does it on what these coastal states priorities identified priorities in their coastal management plans under the CZMA, what that effect might be it really needs to consider it. And in many cases, when it identifies that there's a negative impact, it has to defer to the coastal state if and when it's uh, possible. You can imagine there are examples where it can't defer, whether it's national security, some other issues where the federal government's interest is just so large. But the point is, it really doesn't just get to do anything and everything it wants without even considering coastal states. Federal consistency demands that the federal government has to think about how its actions are going to impact approved coastal states, coastal management plans, and their priorities and the management of those priorities as identified uh, under the Coastal Zone Management Act. That is powerful. It's not just funding to help coastal states figure out how, what are their coastal zones and what are what's important about them and how they manage it, but funding to actually continually implementing and rethinking, going over, reevaluating, right? Their coastal zones, their coastal management plans. Massachusetts has something here that has been engaging in over the past decade or so called the blue economy. And as offshore um, renewable energy, for example, wind and other things has really developed and um, it's really rethinking, Massachusetts is rethinking, what are its priorities? How can it develop uh, um, and how technology is disrupting and other needs and uh, associated things are, are changing the way in which Massachusetts sees its coastal resources. A lot of wind in, uh, off of the coast of Massachusetts. So by identifying these, uh, these new priorities, Massachusetts is effectively going back to the table and seeing how it wants to manage its coastal zone. What are the priorities of its coastal areas and what does it, what does it want to prioritize maybe? In a, how does it want to maybe reorder does it have new priorities and where do those priorities sit amongst existing priorities, that kind of thing. So it's very powerful in that way, but we understand it's carrots, right? So a final point before delving into the coastal zone management in more detail, the CZMA, is to recognize the impact of reduced legal authority on the ability of the federal government to get coastal states to adopt certain coastal management standards. The reduced authority means that the CZMA is really a consensus building instrument from a policy standpoint. When legal authority is diminished, I can't tell you what to do with impunity, then the policy stance changes. I must look at a variety of ways to get you to see my point of view and, hopefully, adopt that view. This is a very different kind of policy stance, and as a result, it impacts the way a statute like the Coastal Zone Management Act is implemented. Pay close attention to this unique policy setting as we move into a deeper review of the CZMA as a method for managing coastal resources. It's really important to think about that, that sort of, you know, hey, how can I get you to come to a sort of framework ideology that I want you to see when I can't force you to do it? And that's really important. We think about other aspects of policy development, you know, carrots and sticks, soft power, the ability to, you know, to, to move somebody in a direction without forcing them to do so under threat of force or fear, you know, that kind of thing. So it's really fascinating, but that's a that's a whole area of sort of policy and looking at how policy is developed and consensus building and that sort of thing. And then you can think about the Coastal Zone Management Act within that context. I think that's a good way to think about it. So in terms of a framework of the Coastal Zone Management Act, 
You know, so we think of the Coastal Zone Management Act is a federal statute. We get that. It's a, it's a federal law, which means it's a law that is passed by Congress and thus it sits below constitutional protections like federalism and above regulations that contradict express provisions of the statute. So we take our hierarchy of laws and we sort of fit where the C, we see where the CZMA fits in, and that's good. But in terms of the framework, we can start with the stated policy goal of the Coastal Zone Management Act. And that stated explicitly in the statute, their policy goal is, is literally this, to preserve, protect, develop, and where possible, to restore and enhance the resources of the nation's coastal zone for this and succeeding generations. So a couple of questions that we can come to in looking at this language, this, this literally stated policy goal. There are some implicit contradictions here. You know, we can begin by knowing these policy goals are contradictory in relation to one another. For example, is the goal of preservation of coastal resources the same as development? Can one preserve the coastal zone while simultaneously developing it? The same question can be posed towards the goals of restoration and development. Is one restoring the coastal zone if they are developing it? Like many compromises, the Coastal Zone Management Act is a statute that bears the hallmarks of building consensus. To garner enough votes of senators and representatives, the language in the statute often reflects the various stakeholders and groups that have vested interest in coastal areas. Thus, we are left with a policy statement in the statute that is somewhat ambiguous. However, we do know from this statement that coastal states adopting CZMA standards can develop plans that include any or all of these stated purposes above. In this way, we have a legal framework through the CZMA that provides lots of latitude to coastal states. So one important thing to say is, yes, these are contradictions. They are, by definition. It's if we take literal definitions or even reasonable interpretations of how to define each of these terms, preservation, development, it's really hard to see how they fit. We understand that you can certainly do preserve development, for example, right? We know that that can happen. You do soft development or development that has a, a very small footprint or a limited footprint or is built into the ecosystems, the existing ecosystems, and doesn't disrupt the existing ecosystems of the coastal zone. So we understand these things have shared space, but they also can be in direct contradiction. Um, if you take a hard line at development and you see some of the development that's happened in our coastal and continues to happen in many of our coastal areas around the country, you might look at that development and say, yeah, that there is no reasonable definition of preservation that fits within that development. So we can see them as contradictions, contradictions both uh, in a vacuum uh, from an academic standpoint, just looking at the terminology, but also, um, you know, um, direct conflicts in terms of um, when we look at how development is occurring, when the actual, you know, expression of development. So that's true, right? And same thing with restoration and development. Is one restoring the coastal zone with development? How do you restore, right, if you're developing it at the same time? So these are important questions. And, you know, one thing that we can throw in here is how does climate change, if at all, impact these stated goals? You know, climate change is tough because it causes a whole sort of cascading set of problems. But one thing that we can look at for sure that affects coastal zones is it causes sea level rise. And it is causing sea level rise, and it's disproportionate. It happens in low lying. We think of coastal zones. I mean, Massachusetts has a low lying coastal zone. It's you know, uh, just a little bit of sea level rise can really move a lot of uplands into underwater because there's just you know the run is really long for a little bit of rise. You know, there because we're very low lying. Uh, so just a couple of inches can move feet and feet and feet inland. Uh, you know the new uh, the new tide mark, the new high tide and low water marks. So um, we can think about the effects of climate change and whether or not those are being considered in terms of coastal management. Right? If you look at your uplands today and you're in a low lying coastal area, you can say that you know if you're just looking at them as static and not subject to change, then you might be making decisions about development that might affect preservation. If you develop up along low-lying coastal areas today that are going to be submerged in 10 or 20 years because of sea level rise. It's hard to think how you preserve coastal resources. It's more likely you'll build things like seawalls, for example, to protect against those rising tides as the 
waters moving in to protect the built environment along those coastal areas. So it's hard to see how that development, that kind of development without thinking about things like climate change might also incorporate the notion of preservation, right? Or restoration, um, because it's really hard to restore it. Again, unless you're thinking about, well, we're gonna let the water move in and we're gonna have to have people move those houses or that you know uh, abandon that development, um, that sort of thing. And those aren't really um, honest uh, things that we think about when we think about coastal zone management and uh, incorporating management into our mindset of, uh, of these stated policy goals. So pragmatically, the Coastal Zone Management Act is meant to create a process. And so we, we have to think about this, regardless of these inherent contradictions in this uh, you know, negotiated policy statement, we think of how laws are made and you know, they're never perfect. They rarely ever are perfect because you don't have a consensus. You're always going to have uh, some form of compromise between you know, differing parties in order to get legislation passed. It's just the way it works in our democratic system. Uh, so in order to do that, you won't have perfect language. You'll have language that allows for anything and everything. So sometimes you get policy statements that say almost nothing when you think about it practically because they say everything. We allow everything to happen. Well, saying everything can happen is almost like not needing the policy statement to begin with, that kind of thing. But pragmatically, the CZMA is meant to create a process starting in 1972 when the statute was passed that entices coastal states to develop coastal management plans. These plans become the basis from which states manage their coastal resources. Prior to passage of the CZMA, coastal states may or may not have, have had a coastal management planning process at the state level. Many of the land use decisions about coastal areas often were delegated to local municipalities leading to inconsistent management decisions. For example, Town A might provide for programmatic coastal development to protect sensitive coastal resources, while Town B might have no coastal development planning, rather combining coastal development with inland land use planning. So even though the CZMA provided wide latitude towards states in the development of those programs, you know, uh, you know, see the policy language here, any programmatic approach to coastal management was a significant leap ahead of what existed before the CZMA. It, it provided consistency within the state for sure, which may not have existed and many times did not exist prior to the Coastal Zone Management Act. So the very act of those coastal states creating coastal management plans, 1972 forward, created uniformity within the state, said, okay, well, look, this is what we're going to prioritize here from a state's perspective. And that allowed for uniformity between municipalities, coastal municipalities within the state moving forward. Operationally, the CZMA works in the following way. I think I have this here, the framework, yeah. Coastal states submit coastal management plans, or CMPs, to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, to NOAA. So the way it operates is, look, you want to have, if you, you don't have to do it, but if you do, almost every coastal, every coastal state has, and I think Alaska has pulled out of it um, in the past uh, five, or, five or so years, maybe five or 10 years, but uh, otherwise, every other coastal state has a coastal management plan. Those, those carrots are significant, right? The funding uh, to develop the plan, but submit a coastal management plan. NOAA reviews, the federal agency reviews those plans to ensure they're in conformance with the Coastal Zone Management Act's criteria for coastal resource identification. So a review of those plans to make sure that they meet the criteria. And if the plans are in conformance, then NOAA approves the plan. While the coastal management plans have wide latitude in how they operate, CZMA's policy statement, they do incentivize statewide planning that creates uniformity within the state's borders, basically just what I was saying. So let's talk about the carrots of funding and federal consistency. Let's bring back our sort of example here. So approval of the state coastal management plan triggers two important carrots of the CZMA. First, approved plans must then be implemented by the coastal states, and the implementation process itself can be expensive. The CZMA provides federal funds to the coastal states for the state to implement its coastal management plan. Thus, there is a financial carrot federal dollars. Mention this carrot. Second, federal consistency is offered to approve coastal management plans, which requires the federal government to consider the impact of its activities on coastal state priorities outlined in their management plans and, where possible, ensure those federal activities do not negatively impact stated coastal priorities. So here we have our example here from before where we have coastal state A, B, and C. A, prioritize tourism, B, oil and gas, and C, fishing. 
each of these coastal states prior to under the let's just start where the Coastal Zone Management Act started and each of these coastal states are developing. So they're incentivized. They're like, we want to do this. So they submit a coastal management plan to NOAA for approval to the federal government agency. NOAA reviews the plan, makes sure that it meets it, the Coastal Zone Management Act's the federal laws requirements. And then if it's approved, they provide two things. They provide money and federal consistency, which is the sort of big carrots. And the money is not just for the plan itself. It's for implementation over time, consistent money. So each of these coastal states get money. And we can think about how this might play out in terms of federal consistency. So now they have funding. They have their state plans. The plans are identified. Their priorities are identified. Their coastal states uh, each each coastal zone is identified for each of the coastal states, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's say the federal government down here, it wants to do an oil and gas, offshore oil and gas lease, and wants to do a development, a new development project after these states have their coastal management plans approved. This is where, so the federal government thinks about its own jurisdiction, of course, has to go through, there's all kinds of national environmental laws, for example, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, uh, that requires the federal government to engage in, you know, a sort of a pre-approval process that considers the consequences, the environmental impacts of the proposed activity. So the federal government's already going to look at the potential impacts that its proposed activity, the offshore oil and gas lease, will have on federal jurisdiction, on its own waters. It's going to do that, and it's required to do that. And NEPA would also require it to look at the states. And states have their own examples of NEPA, by the way. Many coastal states, many states in general do. Massachusetts has NEPA, the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act, uh, Environmental Policy Act, excuse me. So the federal government would already be doing its own review. But as far as the Coastal Zone Management Act, the federal government has to look beyond its borders, has to look beyond federal water and think about what is this potential project going to do to these coastal states identified coastal zones and coastal priorities under their approved coastal management uh, plans under the Coastal Zone Management Act. So we remember that the federal consistency, what's so important about that is that the Fed must conform its action to the state's coastal management plan to the degree that it can. Remember, it's not absolute. There are exceptions where the federal government, even if the federal government finds, there are examples in case law, examples in federal government decisions that are upheld through the judicial uh, courts, where the federal government will engage in an activity that has been identified to frustrate or impact an identified priority of the coastal state. The coastal state is not happy about this. The coastal state says, do not do this. It's going to have a negative impact, and we don't want you to do it. Um, make sure that federal consistency, under federal consistency, under the Coastal Zone Management Act, we want to stop you from doing this because it's going to have a negative impact on our state of priority. The federal government says, we're going to do it anyway. We understand it's going to have a negative impact, but the priorities are just too high and we're going to do it anyway. State government sues in federal court to try to stop and uses federal consistency as its basis. And um, in many cases, the federal government's allowed as long as it has a really good justification to continue to do this. So we're not saying that federal consistency requires the federal government to defer to the state. However, in many, many, many cases, the federal government, just like it does in NEPA, which is a separate topic, the federal government thinks about the impacts it's going to have on those coastal state priorities. And it talks with the coastal state and discusses. And in many cases, the federal government either doesn't do the project or changes the project or limits it in some way that ensures that that coastal state priority is protected. So it, it, federal consistency is incredibly important. It's not absolute is the point I'm making, but it's incredibly important as a process to ensure coastal state priorities are um, not only identified under the Coastal Zone Management Act, but are respected by federal government action. So, sorry. So effectively what that does, the last point here, if you can see down here, is that takes these coastal states it actually, one of the things that federal consistency, I think, does under the Coastal Zone Management Act is it takes their existence outside of their state territorial jurisdiction and places them straight within federal. It gives them an interest in federal waters insofar as federal activities that occur in federal waters in their own land 
um, they are now given a place at the table to, to review those activities and make judgment on those activities prior to those activities taking place. One of the most important things federal consistency does it gives them an interest in the actions that are going, you know, the activities and actions that take place in holy federal waters. And that's powerful. They call that the reverse supremacy clause sometimes, but that's, um, you know, the federal consistency requirement. So the federal government respecting state uh, priorities uh, when um, most of the times it doesn't have to, you know, when it's just working within federal waters. So that's a really, really important carrot. The funding is certainly incredibly important for the planning and the implementation and the ongoing sort of evaluative process. It really helps coastal states um, focus on coastal priorities. Um, but the federal consistency is incredibly powerful because there's a lot of federal water. It's big and it's vast. And there's a lot of things that can be done. There are a lot of resources, natural resources and federal waters that can be exploited. And as our technology advances, uh, we get better at it. We have more capacity to do it. So the idea that coastal states have more and more interest uh, or it's seat at the table at the very least in thinking about these, um, you know, what happens in federal waters is incredibly important. Um, let's see if I can make any points here. So that's policy implications. Let's hold on a moment on that. So let's see here. No, I think that's good. I think that tells us the story. So here we go. Policy implications of the CZMA carrots. So two federal carrots identified in the Coastal Zone Management Act, funding and deference, have both impacted coastal management policy significantly in the United States. In the text, you are provided with a discussion and interpretation of the case law development of the CZMA, including interpretations of such things as federal consistency and context. I'll let that material speak for itself in terms of aiding in your understanding of the Coastal Zone Management Act as a legal framework and the role case law has in interpreting that legal framework. As I've discussed in many cases, federal government has to defer. Many other, in, in certain cases, the federal government doesn't have to, uh, doesn't have to defer to the state um, because of the interest, the important federal interest at state. That case law plays itself out. Those of you that aren't in the course that are reading this, you can look that up. You can look up the history of the case law surrounding the, coast, the implementation of uh, federal consistency under the Coastal Zone Management Act. What I want us to consider, consider here, beyond the sort of legal aspects, is the policy implications that arise from these two carrots in terms of coastal policy. Consider that with passage of the CZMA, all coastal states have now developed coastal management plans that follow federal standards. Alaska now has removed itself. The fact that every coastal state now has a set of management priorities relating to coastal resources is significant, particularly if we compare this to the lack of comprehensive coastal planning that existed prior to the CZMA's enactment. Massachusetts now has an Office of Coastal Zone Management that implements and further develops, as I mentioned, integrated coastal management based on the planning that was originally done under the CZMA. California has its coastal management planning incorporated into statutory language under its State Coastal Act and implemented through the California Coastal Commission, an agency created to help implement coastal planning that was developed in large part through the financial inducements of the Coastal Zone Management Act. Most coastal states have similar examples. The fact that the CZMA's financial inducements were largely successful at moving coastal state towards a more uniform set of management standards for coastlines. As such, the CZMA represents an important example of how policy goals can often be obtained by understanding and working within legal frameworks. As a matter of federalism, there was little direct authority the U.S. government could claim to force coastal states into developing coastal management plans that incorporated federal standards. So instead of doing nothing, or violating constitutional principles of federalism, Congress created incentives, those carrots, through the CZMA. History has proven that such enticements are effective means of accomplishing policy goals. An important take-home message when thinking about policy development in the face of legal framework hurdles. From an implication, uh, I'm sorry, from an implication standpoint, sorry, we understand that moving forward in developing coastal policies, the CZMA has helped provide a starting point all coastal states now have coastal management plans that provide a foundation for coastal policy advancement. It's really important to understand the power of the soft power use of policy. So if you understand the legal frameworks and you look at them and you see the limitations that the federal government had going in to forcing states, coastal states in this case, to do certain things with their land. So then you have to step back and say, well, if we can't force them to do something we'd really want them to do, can we incentivize them to do something? 
Yes. Can that incentive be very narrowly defined? Can we incentivize them in a way that forces them to do something in a narrow context? No, probably not. So we have to be wider in our approach. Think of the policy statement of the Coastal Zone Management Act, its own policy statement. We need to give them an incentive within their own mindset, within their own set of priorities, without telling them how to do, without telling them what to do specifically, what to prioritize. We want to incentivize them in a process. We understand it may be slower in getting towards federal goals, underlying goals of some of the drafters of the Coastal Zone Management Act, some of the policy recommendations of the Stratton Commission. We understand there'll be conflict. We understand coastal state B might prioritize something that coastal state A doesn't want to prioritize and they can impact and affect each other. But that it's much better to start moving in a direction of this sort of standardized, uniform procedural process. And it's been hugely successful. So if we can't force them to do it, let's make it worth their while to do it with these significant incentives, which are the funding mechanism and these big carrots. The other important policy implication from the CZMA derives from the second carrot, federal consistency. So just to go over here really quick, we have development of coastal management plans. Before the CZMA, there was mixed coastal planning from coastal states. Today, most coastal states have approved plans and vibrant coastal management agencies. Now we have federal consistency. We know that federal actions have the potential to impact approved coastal management priorities. But under the CCMA, they must be reviewed prior to the federal action. And if the federal action can reasonably be altered to protect the coastal priority, then it must. This reverse supremacy creates important policy directions for coastal states. Knowing the coastal state priorities have a kind of trump over inconsistent federal actions changes the policy landscape. Prior to the CCMA, coastal states had little reason to believe their priorities would trump federal priorities. The federal government was generally free to act upon its jurisdictional waters without much concern for the impacts of its action on coastal state resources. However, this is no longer the case, and it presents an important change in the policy landscape that was heretofore defined by legal principles of federalism. Understanding this change in the policy landscape because of the CZMA provides a deeper way of considering the policy environment when you think about coastal management choices. So prior to the CZMA, Federal supremacy meant offshore development in federal waters need not explicitly consider state priorities. Didn't have to. And think about the conflicts, the potential and real conflicts that created um, in terms of posturing. So think about a federal government that does whatever it wants on federal waters, regardless of the impact it has on states. Implicit, if not explicit priorities or what the state is doing or what the state thinks it cares about relative to its coastal zones. So federal consistency was very important because it said, look, not only will you have a consistent and identified consistent plan and you other states hopefully will also your adjacent coastal states your partners your neighbors will also have these types of plans that you can then look at and you and will have agencies that you can interact with and you can then even meet and identify where there's a lot of coverage or gaps between your plans where there's an opportunity to work together to work you know uh, so you think about not just the effect that it had relative to the state a coastal state and the federal government the czma also had really important impacts between coastal states because now they, can, they each had coastal management plans they had funded agencies and entities so in that way you can think that not only does it provide this opportunity for sharing of information but federal consistency itself said that look you have a seat at our table when we think about actions in our waters only our waters and that is incredibly important so today, coastal states have no known um, priorities in the coastal management plans, and that along with federal consistency helps to shape coastal state and federal interactions. That is an overview, uh, somewhat detailed overview, I'd say, of the Coastal Zone Management Act. So we remember now we know what it is, what it's intended to do, and the impact that it has had. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, and this will help us now think about how the federal and state governments create their coastal zones, what those coastal zones are, how we identify priorities, and how some of those interactions between federal waters and state coastal waters, how they are defined and how they proceed under the Coastal Zone Management Act, particularly under federal consistency. So thank you for your time.